Hi, this is Toby, and I'd like to introduce you to the RR Debugger. You can find the project information on their project page right here. RR is a time traveling debugger for the languages C, C++, and Rust. Why is RR interesting? So if you think about how developers do debugging today, I would say the techniques that we use are very primitive. Most of us probably use some version of print debugging, uh, whatever the variant of the print statement is in your programming language, you're probably doing that. The problem is print debugging really sucks. You have to litter your code with all of these print statements, which are temporary in nature, you wouldn't really want to check it into your code base. So you have to go back afterwards and clean them up. And you know, sometimes you forget and all your teammates get annoyed. Another problem with print debugging is when you have too many print statements, then your logs become noisy. The signal to noise ratio gets worse and worse, and it's really hard to see what's going on anymore. So what about breakpoint debugging? Why, why don't people use a debugger? Well, the reason that even though debuggers exist, developers are not necessarily using them, there must be a reason for that. And I think the reason is that breakpoint debuggers are actually inefficient uh, in many circumstances uh, when compared to print debugging. There's also a learning curve uh, associated with debuggers, but, but I think one huge problem with traditional breakpoint debuggers is the price is right problem. Trying to set a breakpoint is like playing the price is right. You have to try to get as close as you can without going over. Uh, if you use a breakpoint debugger before, you probably had the experience of single stepping through a function, uh, but then you step over a function and you realize that you've gone too far. We now have seen the problem, but to drill down even more to the actual cause of the problem, we actually would have had to drill down to the function that we just stepped over. In order to do that, what you would have to do is basically restart the entire debugging session. And in many cases, you have to re-perform the steps that you have painstakingly done one after another, just in order to be able to get back to the point where you can drill down to that function again. And this kind of thing actually can happen very often and is why using a breakpoint debugger can become very tedious. Sometimes people just say, you know what? I don't want to bother doing that. I'm just going to do print statements. Another thing about debugging that are tough, if you can't even reproduce the bug, you're not going to be able to fix it. And if you can only reproduce the bug one time out of 10 times, then that means nine times out of the 10, you're going to sort of be wasting your time. To put it another way, you're gonna be spending a lot of time just reproducing the bug. That's just a very tedious process. RR solves all three of these problems by allowing you the ability to travel back in time. One way to evaluate a debugger is, does a developer still revert back to print debugging or not? And in my opinion, RR passes the test. In addition to those three things, um, one thing I found while using RR for more and more of my work is that it really helps me understand complex code easier than ever before. The reason that's true is because the debugger now is so efficient at helping me answer questions about the code that I can really use it as an exploratory tool. Currently, RR works on Linux only, and it is integrated with the GDB debugging tool. It can also work with IDEs that integrate with GDB. How does RR work? Well, RR works using a technique called deterministic replay. And the deterministic replay concept is based on the idea that programs usually are very deterministic. If you have a simple program, if you run this program a hundred times, it'll do the same thing every time. So programs are largely deterministic. Now there are sources of non-determinism. Where do they come from? Well, anytime you use random number, that's a source of non-determinism, or anytime you take input from the user, that's also a source of non-determinism. What RR does is take out the non-deterministic bits. It'll capture them 
in a recording run. So there's a concept of the recording run versus a replay run. During the recording run, it's going to run the program in record mode. Maybe let's, let's take some user input. I'll ask the user for what the top number is. The source of non-determinism is what the user is going to input. So what RR does in, in its recording run, it's going to record what the user entered uh, and it saves that into a file for the replay phase. And then when we run the program in replay phase, it's going to basically read back the value that the user put in um, from that file. It secretly swaps in that pre-recorded value and puts it back as the return value of this input function. Now, given that, how does tr time traveling work in this scheme? If I'm on this line, for example, how do I go backwards? If I run this program again, what we get is a series of, say, instructions that are executed one after another. And if you have a for loop like this, what happens in reality is we get this loop iterated a number of times. So we could uh, sort of visualize it like this. We can number each one of these instructions. If I'm currently inside the debugger and I'm paused on instruction 23, if I wanted to walk backwards in time, back to instruction 22, what I could say is, hey, let's restart the program from the top, but I'm gonna set a breakpoint at instruction 22. So when it gets to instruction 22, that's where I wanna pause. And that achieves the same effect as uh, walking backwards in time by one instruction. So that is how time traveling works with RR. On the right hand side, I have a very small program that calculates the circumference of a triangle. And on the left here, I have a terminal. I'm gonna run my uh, triangle program and you can see it gives the answer as 8.4 something. For the discerning viewers, uh, if you're hip to the Pythagorean theorem, you recognize this is the 345 triangle, and therefore the circumference should be 3 plus 4 plus 5, which equals 12. So that's the wrong answer. We're going to try to debug that. If we want to use RR to debug this, we run this program within RR in RR's record mode. Um, it again gives the answer. RR will generate a trace into this subdirectory, uh, which contains all of the information that RR needs to replay this exact same code execution. If we run it in re replay mode, now we can use the back in time features. To RR replay, as a command line argument, the path to the directory that the record mode recorded to, like this, uh, but if we're just interested in replaying the most recent recording, then we can leave that off. So we'll just say RR replay. And now we're inside the GDB CLI interface, but it's using RR as a backend. For those of you who are not familiar with GDB, I'll cover some of the basic commands that you might use in GDB listed here. If you're already familiar with this stuff, you can skip to the next part of the video. Normally in GDB, when you start up the debugger, you actually have to call the run command to tell your program to start running. Uh, but RR has already done that for us. We're already paused at the beginning of the program. The be but the beginning of the program is not the beginning of your main method. Uh, instead, it's the beginning of some bootstrap code, which I believe is in libc. And the bootstrap code is gonna do some setup code and then call into your main function, and then it'll do some cleanup code. So what we have to do is, if we wanna start stepping within our main function, we first have to set a breakpoint. This command, uh, it has a abbreviation, which is B. So we could type break main to stop at the first thing in the main function. The, the break command has a couple of different syntaxes. You can say break, the name of the function, f or something. Or if you want to stop at a specific line, you would write the specific line number. First, you would write the name of your file, which is triangle.c, and then you write colon, and then you write the name of the line. So those are the two ways of writing a breakpoint. We're gonna use the first way, which is brick main, okay? Or you could have also done b main. 
to use the abbreviation. It would have done the same thing. It looks like I've just uh, made two breakpoints at the same location. Uh, so if I want to clean that up, I can always use the info break command. And that will show all the brick points I have currently. Uh, currently I have two of them. I can delete one of them by using the delete command, like so. And now I ho only have one command. So anyway, now we have a brick point at the beginning of the main function. I'm gonna say continue um, to continue the program until it hits the next brick point, which will be here. So now we're at the beginning of the main function. I can say step or next. Some of you might be more familiar with debuggers that have more UI. Um, you might be familiar with these buttons. So I'll map the GDB commands to these buttons. So this continue button, that looks like a play button. In GDB, that's also called continue and it has an abbreviation C. For this step over button, which you're on this line and if this line has a function call, you wanna step over this function call and you wanna end up on the next line, whatever that line is. This step over in GDB is called next. If you wanna, instead of stepping over, you don't wanna do that. You wanna step into it, ending up within the body of the function, then that's the step in function. In GDB, that's just step. Finally, if you're already inside the function, you wanna come out of the function. Basically skip to the end of the function and then come out, ending up here. In GDB, that is called finish, or F for short. For all four of these, there's a reverse version of that as well, which is enabled uh, by RR, basically stepping backwards in time. So for example, I can step over, next, 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 all the way until the here, line 41. And now I can actually see what the answer is by using the print command down here. And I can see the answer. And at this point, uh, I could actually step back in time. I'll say reverse next, or RN for short. And now I actually step back in time before calling this triangle circumference function. And I can actually step into the function using the step command. And now I'm inside the triangle circumference function. Now that we have the basics out of the way, let's try to debug this program. Uh, one strategy that traveling back in time enables is something called the backup and drill down, which is more or less what we just did. We basically step over the execution of this function, and then we verify that the answer was wrong. Because we have the ability to travel back in time, we don't have to be so worried about going over, because if you go over, all you do is you step backwards, and then after we're there, we can just go inside, and then we can end up here. So now we've just backed up, and we're gonna drill down. We're gonna use the same strategy. We're gonna just step over each of these lines, we're gonna verify the answers of the subproblems, which is calculating the distance of each side. We're gonna verify if they are all correct. One of them is probably wrong, and then when we find out which one is wrong, we'll then drill down to the corresponding one, okay? Again, we don't have to be worried about going over because we can always step backwards. Let's print them all. Uh, whoops. Okay, so 4.24 and then 0 and then 4.24. The correct answers should have been 3, 4, and 5. So all of them look wrong to me. I might just pick the 0 one because that looks like the most suspicious one. So I'm going to go into the call that calculated side 2. I just jump back to before we made this distance call, and then we're gonna go in by using the step command. So now we're inside this distance call, and what the distance call is gonna do is calculate two distances, square them, and then uh, take the square root of the sum of those squares. Um, let's see what numbers we're working with. 
Now, one thing I can do is print them again using the p command. But another thing I can actually do to see the values is use the backtrace, uh, which uh, I want to show you. The backtrace command, or, or bt for short, either way works, actually show you the all the frames in your uh, stack frame. So this is actually an easy way to see your function parameter values. So you can see in this case, we're calculating the distance between the point 0, 0 and uh, 3, 0. The answer should be 3. If we jump to the end of this function uh, using the finish command, it'll also show you the return value. The return value is 0, which is clearly wrong. Um, and at this point, I can inspect the intermediate values. So how can 0 be 1? Uh, what's, this, what's the sum of the squares? What's the first square? Uh, I might have to go backwards by 1. So say reverse step. Yeah, now we're, we're backwards into that function now. And now I'm going to print out st1 is 0. Uh, I think that's correct. What about st2? It's also 0. So the y minus the y, that should be the 0. But the other one should be 3, or, or the square of 3. So that's clearly wrong. What's the... Ah, okay. Both of them we use d1 for the squaring, whereas one of them should use d2 for the squaring. So I've isolated the bug, and this is likely the fix here. I rebuilt the program, run it, and this looks like the correct answer this time. So as you can see, we can really get a lot of mileage out of RR's time traveling feature for basic debugging tasks like these. There are even more powerful ways to use time traveling. A couple of new techniques that RR enables really changes the game for me. And I'll show you those techniques in upcoming videos. In general, RR really has been a joy for me to use. And uh, if you haven't used it before, I hope you give it a try.